This is the overpowered Walmart eSports laptop. You may have heard of the eSports overpowered brand that appears to be exclusive to Walmart after several people bought the desktop versions of this and it was not good. Some of them just didn't even have the 8-pin connector plugged into the video card. Others had weird decisions that seemed to put more into aesthetics and lighting as opposed to performance with those desktops. It was very, very odd. So I thought, why don't we, why don't we take a look at the, the laptop? We can even take it apart. It could be interesting. And you know what? It is, because this is a very, very strange laptop. And today I'm gonna to show you why. First thing though, the specs as shown on the box that you get, GTX 1050 with two gigabytes of GDDR5 memory, Intel i5-8300H processor, that is a quad core with hyper-threading, giving you eight threads that you can use with things like content creation and video editing, or of course, if you're doing things in Blender. And then you also have eight gigabytes of DDR4 RAM at uh, 2,666 megahertz. We'll come back to that when we open it up because there's an interesting little bit with that one. And then you also have the 1080p IPS 144 hertz display, which again is a weird decision. RGB backlit mechanical keyboard, very nice keyboard actually, I enjoy typing on it. One terabyte mechanical hard drive, a 128 gigabyte SSD that appears to be done in an M.2 form factor. And then Windows 10 Home, of course, comes pre-installed as you would kind of need that. As for IO ports, we have Two USB 3.0s on the side along with an SD card reader. On the back is actually kind of interesting because we have two mini display ports here, HDMI and USB Type-C. To the right of that is the power charger where the plug goes. The odd thing about that is it's a right angle charger, so usually when you sit it down it's either going to kind of run into these ports or it's going to cover up your fan output so you kind of have to decide a lot of people will probably end up just putting it this way because if you have anything plugged in here well it's not going to work that way but an odd spot for this it might have even been better to put it on the other side maybe over here or if the plug was just a straight angle rather than a right angle you know just straight back it would have been better there and then finally on this side we have a usb 2.0 port kind of an, a slim ethernet port that has to extend open to plug in then you also have headphone and microphone and then a lock for any stores that want to display it. So first let's start with the good things about the laptop that, that I like. The screen being IPS is actually good to look at. Color representation is definitely above average and overall it's actually a good display. Compared to some of the other laptop models that have like TN screens, this is, uh, this is much better. The keyboard also very good. It's mechanical, so of course you get a nice travel, you get a nice clicky sound as you're typing on it. Keep in mind though, it is louder than most laptop keyboards, so if you are getting this and you're going into like a classroom setting, you might annoy your neighbor, but that's up to you if, if you care or not. The RGB keyboard is actually pretty nice as well since you can program any key to be any color you want. You can also do wave effects, pulsing. You could customize this keyboard to be whatever you want in like the RGB spectrum and really cool effects. It's actually a nice keyboard overall in what was supposed to be a $1,000 laptop. And while we're on the topic of pricing, $1,000 for this laptop doesn't really make a lot of sense. For about 1100 to 1200, you can get a laptop that has a decent GPU of a 1060, maybe 1070 if something's on sale, and an i7, whereas this is an i5-8300H with a GTX 1050, not even a 1050 Ti with two gigabytes of video memory. So you can kind of see the issue here, but one thing about this laptop that was interesting to myself and I know several others is that this continued to fall in price. It didn't stay at $1,000 for very long, and that's probably because of where it was classified with other laptops around it that opted for Screens didn't have massive refresh rates, and of course keyboards that weren't as nice as this one, and even the slim form factor, those are things you lose as you work your way up the power spectrum on a laptop. Generally they'll become larger, you might not have a mechanical keyboard that's full RGB like this one, and then you might not have a 144 hertz screen, but generally you get a better video card inside, and then you also get, of course, a better processor. This one decided to not do any of that and put a, 10, a 1050 in an i5, just with nicer shell. So over probably about a month's time, this laptop dropped in price from 1,000 down to 800, down to 600, to eventually where it fell all the way down to $530 before it went out of stock, which is where it sits now. 
The other one above it has actually also been dropping in price. That is a 1060 and an i7 down to about $800. And it seems to have the same type of form factor. So when we open this up, it'll give you an idea as to how it's built, which is something I really wanted to, I guess, come to the conclusion of. The screen is interesting to me because I think that's where they dumped most of their money. And then I guess just the, cha the chassis inside to see if it really would accommodate something like a 1060 and an i7 because I have a feeling that more expensive laptop is this just with different internals. As for performance in games, right now it's running the Heaven benchmark that seems to jump between 30 and 40 frames per second with medium to heavy tessellation depending on where I set it. You'll get 30 or 40 and then of course everything on high with no anti-aliasing so you can kind of get an idea from that, I played some games just to see if the 144 hertz screen would make any sense at all. Grand Theft Auto 5 with medium to high settings at 1080p sat anywhere from 60 to 70 frames if I was lucky. And then something like Doom, which is one that I was hoping I could get a higher frame rate out of, again, about 60 to 70 frames. Sometimes I was getting about 75 frames on Doom, but that was, again, me playing around with the settings, just trying to get that higher frame rate. Most people who play on PC prefer a higher frame rate as opposed to a prettier scene in front of you. And I was able to at least get Doom to roughly 70 to 75 frames, but still, it wasn't 144 frames. So I thought to myself, what's a game that people in esports might be inclined to play on a laptop? And Counter-Strike, that was an easy thought. Okay, let's let's try out Counter-Strike. And yes, Counter-Strike does take advantage of this screen, where if you even just run the benchmark, it's in the 200s in terms of frame rate. And when you actually play, yeah, it does actually get above the 144 screens fresh refresh rate. So if you're playing Counter-Strike or League of Legends, Fortnite, again, 60, 70, maybe 80 frames if you're lucky, but some of those lower spec esports games, this actually makes sense. And at $530, if it ever comes back into stock, which I don't think it will, it's actually not terrible. $530 for a system that can play those type of games at high frame rates, other games at 60 frames per second, most times when you play around with the settings, it's not, it's not too bad, but I still question the 144 hertz screen and why it even exists in this thing. One other issue I ran into with this thing, outside of the hard drive, which I'll talk about in a second, is the fan speed. See, one thing I've noticed, and one way I can kind of tell that overpowered is kind of new to the game here when it comes to laptops, is their fan curve that's designed, especially when it comes to the BIOS, which will detect as the GPU gets hotter, the fans will start to ramp up. This one seems to let the GPU get to roughly 60 to 7 degrees Celsius until it kicks into overdrive and tries to take off, essentially. The fan gets very, very loud. You're not going to be playing games in like a college classroom in incognito because you'll let everyone know in the classroom that you are currently playing Doom or GTA 5. This thing goes nuts when it gets to a certain temperature and then it'll start to slow down. Rather than a gradual ramping of the fan up, it doesn't do that. It just blasts and tries to just take off. As for the hard drive, the M.2 drive is quick as we would expect. The two and a half inch mechanical, and, and I feel like it's over here because I always hear it. It makes noises that are not good, and a few times now I've had programs warn me the hard drive is having errors, which, uh, well, we'll find out what hard drive's in there in a minute. Just know the two and a half inch hard drive doesn't seem that great. It's a one terabyte drive for storage, so you're not putting your your OS on there, but still, you might have important files that you decide to put on there, and if you do get something like this from Overpowered, 
maybe back up your files to external just in case. So I guess we'll go ahead and shut it down, take a look inside of it. As for Unigen, it's been running this whole time, the Heaven Benchmark, and it's currently sitting at about 74 degrees Celsius, which isn't terrible for a laptop as they do get pretty hot for some of the more powerful ones. But keep in mind, it's a 1050 with an i5. It's not like a 1070 with an i7. So I again, I feel like just their fan profile, which you can set up yourself, could be a lot better. I also double checked on their website to see if they have drivers of any kind, maybe a BIOS update that could fix that. The only thing I found was one file per laptop or per desktop that was just a large, I think five gigabyte file for this one. And it just has all the drivers packed in, which is odd. It's definitely different than most laptop manufacturers. And I noticed those drivers weren't there a week ago when I checked just to see what I was dealing with. Okay, we finally get to take a look inside the laptop. Looking on the back here, it's a pretty cool design actually on the bottom. Nice large rubber pads here, just mounts to kind of grab the table that you're sitting it on. So it doesn't slide around very easily, which again is good. And it looks like there's not a lot to have to take off here to get inside. As you're seeing here, it looks like it's just a bunch of Phillips head screws on the bottom. And the nice thing is, I do know eventually a lot of laptop designs started to move to a more uh, bottom to top design. Whereas before, with all the laptops I've had to work on, which is probably over a thousand at this point with what I was doing before, it was a real, real pain to take apart laptops such as HPs and Toshibas because you would usually have to unscrew the bottom and then take the keyboard out and then go in through the palm rest. And it was seriously just a whole thing to do that. I like these type of designs where it's just bottom up and I can seriously just get right to the motherboard by just taking some of these screws off. So we're gonna go ahead and pull these out and I see a nice little warranty seal there, which is awesome considering to do things like even change out your RAM, you're gonna be breaking a warranty seal, which I, we all question now anyway with how some of the FCC stuff has passed. So I don't think they can really do much about that if you decide to remove the warranty seal, but I'm sure they would at least try to fight it. So here we are, we have it open. Uh, here's our two and a half inch drive right away. You can see that there, Wi-Fi card here. And then we have our M.2 128 gigabyte. What's interesting though is they have another one set up here. It's blank which makes me believe that we could just add another one here and it should see that in its BIOS and everything. That's actually kind of neat. They have that right there. So you can just add one. Now around the edges here, we do have USB ports, the SD card reader, two uh, mini display ports on the back, a USB type C, HDMI, our power cable here. And then we have kind of a low profile ethernet on this side along with uh, headphone and microphone in, and then another USB port, USB 2.0. But looking inside here, it actually doesn't look too bad. These pipes are still very hot, by the way. So this, this whole thing gets very, very toasty. And I'm surprised that their cooling with their fans are as bad as they are. But we're gonna, we're gonna pull this off because a 1050 and an i5 shouldn't be very difficult to cool. Battery here is a 46.74 uh, watt hour battery, 4,100 milliamp hours. This battery does not keep this laptop alive for very long. It's like two to two and a half hours just doing things like web browsing. So it's, it's not a very large battery. And a lot of that probably has to do with this thing being more slim design, which makes me question the next one up. The RAM slots here are, ooh, okay. So this is good. Okay, so the RAM slots, actually has one that's not populated. That's good and bad. It's, it's good because you can add your own stick in there and get 16 gigabytes without too much issue. It's bad because it's not running a dual channel right now, but, but one of these probably isn't terribly expensive. Gold key, eight gigabytes DDR4. One of these is probably like 50 to 60 bucks. So for an extra 50 to 60 at the most, maybe if you find some on sale, you could double the RAM to 16 gigabytes, which would be better for people who are doing content creation. Uh, although again, the one that's a step up already has 16 gigabytes in it. That would be more so if you've been stuck with this laptop and you just want to upgrade. Unfortunately, I don't think I have to go very deep just to get to the, the chipsets here, to take a look at the GPU and the CPU, but I want to see this hard drive because I hear this thing constantly. All right, this is, I don't want to take it all the way out. This is a Seagate, that's actually a Barracuda. That's interesting. It's a Seagate Barracuda Compute. A Barracuda Pro actually isn't terrible, so I don't know. Maybe I just got a, you know, the, the hard drive roulette and I just got one that doesn't do that well, but this shouldn't be that bad. I mean, Seagate isn't my preferred hard drive vendor, but 
it still should not make those kind of noises that it's making right now. Like they are audible noises when I'm doing anything with this laptop. So I'll have to keep an eye on that, especially when programs start saying, hey, you might want to double check that hard drive. Uh, you get a little concerned about putting anything important on it. So they have one tension mounted screw at the top there. Uh, usually it has a spring just to kind of help out with tension on the CPU. The GPU and the CPU actually shares a screw right there, which is kind of funny. Then we have a few here. I'm probably gonna have to also kind of remove this little, these little shrouds they have here for uh, the heat sinks and the heat pipes, the fins next to the fans, and then, uh, then we should be able to pull this up. All right, we finally got this guy off. Had to kind of shimmy it out with all of the, uh, everything, uh, kind of trying to hold it down at once. There we go. And okay, so this doesn't, this is actually not a bad looking heat sink overall. I mean, it's, it's actually a pretty good size. It has a good weight to it. Good copper pipes. Yeah, copper plate here to grab it. We got plenty of thermal pads for memory and other components around it. This doesn't look bad. The one issue I think you run into with this is that the CPU and the GPU technically share heat pipes and that can get you in a bit of an issue, a little bit of trouble there to where one will, could possibly heat up the other and they are not independent of each other. That's something that I like with some of the older Republic of Gamer laptop is that they attempted to do that and sometimes it actually worked out pretty well where both the GPU and the CPU were, were cooled separately with their own heat pipes, their own fans and everything. This has just a dual fan that just tries to cool everything at once. And unfortunately it's all kind of connected, which again can run into a problem where one will heat up the other. Their, their thermal compound isn't bad. They may have applied a bit too much and it looks like just standard compound. So it's not like anything crazy going on. Yes, everything is soldered by the way. You're not upgrading any of this. A lot of that, a lot of time that happens when you're trying to create a very low profile system, which is what they're doing here. And uh, just unfortunately, you can't upgrade the CPU and you can't do anything with the GPU. It's not like an MXM card or anything like that. The charge port is also located up here and it's soldered to the board. Sometimes you get lucky and different companies will make them plug-ins. So like HP has done that for a lot of their laptops where it's actually a plug-in adapter. So to replace it, if you break off a little pin in there or something, you can open it up and just unplug it, plug a new one in and close the laptop back up. Again, they've gone with a soldered connection here. Actually looks very similar to what I expect out of an Asus if I had to compare it to something for the, the charge port. I know I'm talking about charge ports, but it reminds me of what I see with an Asus charge port. So I guess some of the things I like about the internals, it's, it's I mean, it's well built overall. The hinges up here are not reliant on plastic. They're actually screwed directly into the base. Hinges can be a big problem. And I like the wraparound design of these hinges for a couple reasons. One, it's pretty easy to tighten it. So if you take the back off, because you feel your maybe these are getting a little loose just from opening and closing. You can actually just open them, tighten a couple of these screws, and you're back in business without too much issue. And since it's not pulling up on, uh, on the base, which happens with Toshiba's laptops all the time, there's a good chance it won't actually crack and break, which is a good thing because when that happens, it's a whole thing to fix it. I also like that if they were gonna put eight gigabytes of memory in here, I like they left one of these unpopulated because that makes it very easy to upgrade it. Although again, it's a double-edged sword because then you're not getting dual channel and it's kind of an issue out of the gate for people who don't wanna upgrade it. I like the extra uh, M.2 slot there because you can drop another one in and, uh, and you can either upgrade this one or put another one in for storage. That's actually really neat just for upgradability. And uh, looking at everything else, that's I guess that's really about it. USB ports are separate boards. Again, that's good for repairability. The one, some of the things I don't like with the big one, I guess just being that it's, they have pipes running across everything. So the CPU could be working and the GPU will feel some of that heat. I guess if they tried to divide it down the middle, maybe they were running into issue with that, but maybe that's something they could think about a way to cool both uh, kind of separately. Also, they got to figure out something with this battery. This battery is just too small. That's I guess the last thing there, but let's put this guy back together. Okay. And we will now take a look at the screen, the 144 hertz screen, because I, I kind of want to try to identify it and see how much they're spending on it. Okay, so we talked about the 144 hertz 1080p screen, IPS, and there's a lot of question around that because it doesn't really make sense on this laptop, but I figured we'd pull the screen and see if we can match it up to model, just see exactly how much money they maybe spent on a screen that doesn't really match the internals because it could end up being a large waste of money. So the good news is pulling a screen out of a laptop is generally pretty easy. You might take it to like a repair shop and they might say hundreds and hundreds of dollars, $400 to repair it. 
uh, it doesn't cost that much. Usually a standardized 15.6 LED screen that goes into a standard laptop, those are like 60 bucks and it's actually a pretty easy repair to do. So we're actually gonna pull this screen and it looks like this actually is done through a set of clips around here. And you can usually just pop them off carefully and it's all plastic clips. If you need to use something, you can use like an old like credit card or like uh, one of those hotel like paperish kind of key cards they give you that's like soft plastic. That works well. Don't use anything really metal. Like don't really use a, a like a Phillips head or I'm sorry, a flat head screwdriver. That could actually end up damaging the screen or even the clips around it. So this one's actually not too bad. I'm already unclipping it all the way around the bottom. And I'm gonna work my way up around the edge here. It was easier to kind of get in down uh, at the bottom and then kind of work my way around uh, just carefully, just kind of wiggling and it unclips itself for the most part. At the top is interesting because it kind of goes underneath here at the top. So I'm gonna try to see if I can kind of lift it up from here. But oh, we got it off. It's a pretty thin piece of plastic that covers it. This is mostly just the cover. It doesn't really act as much else considering the screen is pretty much screwed into the back plate. So it's all screwed in down here and it's not even really around the edges. A lot of times you'll even have screws kind of around the edges here. Okay, so we made some developments here and some interesting stuff. I pulled the screen, some jerk decided to glue it to the back of the, uh, of the backing here and it was a real pain to get it off without damaging the screen. They put like these stickers on the back to hold it in rather than, you know, just screw the screen into the sides, probably to make it thinner. So I guess it at least makes some sense there, but it was a re really, really annoying getting this thing off. I'll admit that. but. But after I pulled it, I managed to get the model number for it, which I then matched up to where it's coming from. The screen itself that they use in here is definitely more expensive than they probably had to go with, considering they could have got away with like a 60 hertz LED screen or something. But they definitely seem to have an interest in trying to provide a very smooth experience, it seems. This is the same screen that's in those more expensive HP Omens, the Omen 15s that are right around $1,600, $1,700. This is the same 144 hertz 1080p IPS screen that's in that one. I looked it up, the screen's about 170 ish dollars just for the LCD. That's actually very expensive for a laptop panel. That's like in like MacBook Pro like territory for screens. And I said the screen looked good, it does. And it seems like they're using at least a high quality screen, a display here. And I'm starting to figure out more and more that this is mostly geared towards the easier to run esports games that could hit that 144 uh, hertz or the, you take advantage of that. But very, very interesting to see this display being used because this laptop, like I said, when I stock at about $530, that means the screen is like a quarter of that price. So that's, that's actually kind of impressive. And so that is the Walmart overpowered laptop. It's an interesting device that doesn't really need that kind of a screen paired with that kind of a video card for larger AAA style games. But in the, in the case of someone who wants the high frame rate for something like Counter-Strike or League of Legends, this makes a bit more sense. At the thousand dollar price point, absolutely not. But at the 500 or even $600 price point, Maybe. I mean, really, stuff around it at that point still sticks with its integrated uh, iGPU or GPU that sticks with, like, the i7, for example, or the i5. And then you start getting up to the six, $700 range with a 1050 like this one, but certainly not the mechanical keyboard in this type of display. I'm really curious about the model above this that is rapidly dropping in price now down to $800. Something like this with 16 gigabytes of memory, 256 gigabyte M.2 paired with a one terabyte hard drive and a GTX 1060 with this screen might actually make sense. So depending on how this video does, Maybe we'll take a look at that one next. Let me know what you guys think about that down below and this laptop. You know what? It's not terrible. For $1,000, yeah, but for this price, not really. It's out of stock now, though, so who knows if it'll ever come back. But for the people who took advantage of the five to $600 pricing, you actually might have lucked out with the, this one. Thanks, guys, for watching, and I'll see you next time.